recently magazine editor in chief, uh, which is uh, one of the highest impact uh, publications in the electrical and uh, computer engineering. So help me welcome uh, Professor Wu. Hospitalities. I really uh, enjoy meeting with uh, colleagues who I have, have known for a number of years and uh, get to know uh, new colleagues and students. We had very uh, enjoyable discussions about the career this morning. Um, so today I'm going to uh, give you a, an overview on um, some of the uh, research problems that we are tackling in recent years. Um, and it's actually connecting, as the title says, connecting power and multimedia. These two things individually has really undergone very exciting uh, research advances and also changed the way we, we work and live. Uh, we have uh, this smart grid um, and power systems and a number of uh, cyber security, cyber uh, physical system issues, and I have visited the cyber um, uh, smart grid lab this morning, um, and I had really nice discussions. And on the multimedia side, where is my ground background really lies, uh, I uh, really on the teaching and also foundations have uh, uh, really begun into this uh, signal, uh, image, uh, video processing. So, so our multimedia, uh, thanks to both the algorithm side as well as all the supporting computing, uh, electronics, uh, communications, uh, we uh, really have the multimedia devices uh, uh, in the old days. So we have to have that bigger equipment, such as the video taping machine today. But now, everyone can do uh, capturing, can communicating, can archiving, and sharing. Um, so the connections is really not obvious. Uh, other than um, multimedia, really, all these devices take an uh, ever growing amount of power usage, and we will need the power to uh, support um, the, the running of our machine. But what I want to tell you, the connection is deeper and also more interesting, uh, where uh, we can find the power traces actually inside a multimedia signal, multimedia uh, signal capture in your video recording, sound recording. And those connections can help us uh, answer a number of interesting questions, uh, especially related to um, the history, the integrity, uh, and uh, uh, where and when our multimedia content has been captured. And also that leading to interesting application, both on security and in the enjoyment, uh, as well as the digital humanity applications. Uh, the connection is those uh, signals that I would call as micro signals. By micro signal, I mean those signals in terms of their magnitude and also sometimes as in terms of scale are much smaller than the dominant ones, usually by one order of magnitude or more. But by exploiting uh, those micro signals actually induced by the power inside a multimedia, it enables us uh, to answer a number of questions I raised uh, earlier. Uh, in fact, my research, uh, the micro signal is a main thrust of uh, uh, my research work in the past uh, more than a decade. Uh, we have exploited different type of micro signal. Those are signals uh, uh, that we used to really don't call it signal, we call it noise, very nuances. But we are exploiting those almost invisible, um, those signals that you cannot see by naked eye, you may not be able to hear uh, by our, um, um, our ears, but we can exploit them to answer a number of questions. Some of those micro signals uh, are inherent uh, tied with the properties, the characteristics of the devices, including cameras, but also a number of other type of devices. And by exploiting them, uh, we can uh, address uh, whether this, uh, um, um, how this uh, picture was generated, how this content was generated, uh, has it been tampered, uh, and whose phone took a picture. That uh, can be a question um, very useful for digital detectives. We also see um, micro signals from everyday physical objects. Just to take any piece of paper, a notepad, or any surfaces. Uh, um, it, we see them as really uniform, but uh, under a microscopic levels, uh, that surface is actually very busy up and down. What you see on this slide is really amplifications of that microscopic uh, surfaces. And that's unique for every piece of paper, every part, every patch of paper. If we can exploit them, we can record, derive a hash, and that can actually authenticate whether you have the original document or original 
uh, product packagings or it's a duplicated ones that is a fake ones. Uh, and those are a form of uh, path of physically unclonable features that we can exploit uh, using imaging devices, scanners, but also uh, more recently in my group, we are able to use mobile phones to actually capture that microscopic differences. The micro signals are also in the form um, of uh, uh, signals that we can design to our advantages. Um, and quite a while back, we were working on this uh, tracing problems uh, where when you have multiple copies of the same classified document, say a satellite image distributed to different uh, um, receivers, uh, some of them uh, may want to leak. And how can we uh, discourage the leak in the first place by putting then those invisible tracers uh, so that, that by invisibility, by that micro uh, uh, signal nature, uh, it doesn't interfere with the hosting content, but we have uh, good properties in our designs uh, to uh, make sure they are able to help us trace to the source of the leak. And today I'm going to focusing on those micro signals that really represent our ambient environment during the sensor capturing, and they help us uh, address very important questions, actually two type of questions, very difficult to answer when you are considering the processing history, the provenance of digital evidence, that is time and location. But in what situation we may be really interested in time and location? Um, a good example to motivate is to think of the propaganda video uh, coming from Bin Laden. During his lifetime, whenever there's a propaganda video, many people around the world fighting this terrorist is going to be very, very busy. They want to know when this video was made and where the video was made. There's a soundtrack, there's a visual track. Are they captured at the same time? Which means a certain intelligence information. Or are they captured separately and then later on uh, merging it using uh, a computer um, editing software? So to address those questions, uh, almost none of the traditional computer security crypto-based evidence would be useful. Even for those uh, um, um, evidences that we could potentially derive associated with video camera to that, it may not really tell us about time and location. Uh, the answer is actually lies on our ambient environment. Video recording or sound recording is a form of sensing. And our sensors can be affected uh, by the surrounding environment during this sensing process. If they capture certain uh, information around this ambient environment, uh, we will be able, um, by using signal processing uh, techniques uh, and using theory to formulate and then using algorithm to extract, we can extract them and then helping us to address those uh, uh, forensic and security questions. So what you see here is a spectral one coming from the, the power grid that actually induced uh, onto the visual track of some of the recordings. Uh, and uh, this is actually representing the varying instantaneous frequencies of our power grid. So looking at the, um, this uh, um, varying frequencies known as ENF, standing for electric network frequencies of our power grid, um, let's do a very brief introduction on some of the interesting properties of the ENF. Um, so ENF is the um, supply uh, frequencies of our power generations. Uh, and we know, in particularly in the department here, you have a strong uh, power engineering groups. Uh, and uh, even without uh, taking their courses uh, in our um, um, middle school and uh, science classes, we know the power in terms of voltage and the current is following, a, in our modern world, is following a sinusoid waveform. If we look on how many cycles uh, in the uh, US, so we have a 60 hertz uh, as a nominal frequency uh, in most part of the world, in Asia and um, uh, where I come, origin come from, and Europe, uh, uh, most of the countries have 50 hertz grid. Um, if we are going to tap into our power outlet today, now, um, and then uh, measure this waveform in terms of uh, um, the common number of cycles at a given time, in that frequency is actually almost never to be exactly 50 or 60 hertz for a real world grid. 
is actually ever changing because our demand for electricity is changing and our power control is this big distributed systems are going to try to match uh, the demand with the proper amount of uh, power supply, power generation. And through this control uh, dynamic process, uh, what we can observe, the instantaneous frequency will be changing around the nominal frequency. It's important from the power generation point of view to keep that as stable as possible for the proper functioning of many power equipment and uh, in the grid for the stability. Um, but this varying natures from a forensic point of view can be interesting if we can record this, we know the power condition. And another interesting um, observation and the knowledge from the power engineering is in terms of the major trends of this uh, um, ENF variations, the major trends are the same anywhere in the same uh, interconnected grid. Uh, for the grid in US, this, we have three major grid. We have our um, eastern grid of uh, Maryland from where I now come from in Iowa um, are all come belonging to the uh, same eastern grid. So if I want to know what is the major trends of this ENF variations, uh, um, is it sufficient for me to build a small circuit uh, in my lab and then measure what is instantaneous frequency? Uh, when we are different at any given time from those on the west coast because they are in a different grid, uh, even if we run similar algorithms, uh, uh, we are not interconnected, so our frequencies and, 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 uh, um, in the instantaneous uh, nature so will be different at any given time. And Hexas is always special. <coughs> um, so from the sensing point of view, so, um, many of our sensors are our, um, electronic uh, devices, and they can be affected by the um, um, this, uh, really big uh, electromagnetic field that generated um, and uh, uh, influenced by our uh, power grid. So depending on the type of uh, sensing modalities, uh, we can see that uh, in, uh, in our sensing signal through a few mechanisms. If we have these recorders uh, with uh, a cord and plug into the power outlet, that electrical interference can be quite profound. If we look at those uh, um, uh, nominal frequency around those uh, frequency areas, as well as harmonics, we may see faint but detectable traces. Even for battery powered devices, in fact, most of our measurement and the data collected through battery powered devices, such as cell phone, such as standalone uh, cameras and the video cameras, uh, um, those uh, in the sound recorders, the, um, the microphones, uh, uh, depending on mechanisms, they can be affected by the electromagnetic field. And even if the uh, interference uh, is there but is weak to detect it, there are other mechanisms such as when you are in the neighborhood of uh, uh, major power equipment, our light included, the various transformers and others, uh, uh, they could have uh, mechanical or acoustic vibrations that can be picked up by our microphone uh, recorders. Um, so when I first uh, learned this work, I was really fascinated um, in uh, uh, this uh, pioneering work on the acoustic side to see that uh, and make use of this ENF uh, was uh, the representing work, work was by a Romania forensic scientist, uh, uh, Caitlin Gragas, uh, and he had done pioneering work uh, on that. And even before his work, uh, this uh, power kind of influences as a time wave, not Per the instantaneous frequency variation per se, but as a time wave contiguous there, uh, was also uh, being exploited in the investigations uh, of the Watergate uh, scandals uh, in the 70s. Uh, so as uh, I consider myself, even though I also play with the sound signal, I play more with visual signals. As a visual person, I was really fascinated. So my question is, uh, can this be seen uh, from the visual channel? The answer is actually yes. And the, but the mechanism is different because our visual sensors work differently compared with our sound sensors. Um, mostly this uh, coming from the lightings, especially in the indoor recording environment, we almost always have the lighting there. The light is connected with the power and they um, have the slight changes because of our voltage and current uh, running through them following these sinusoidal changes, uh, their brightness uh, uh, could change accordingly, and that may be picked up by our optical sensors. 
Um, so what you will see here is actually um, those sense of in the video. And this is from the power measurement from the outlet. And you see over time vertical axis and horizontal axis is the frequency. Um, you see over time it has deviated uh, quite a bit from the nominal. This, is from the, this was from the Indian grid. And then from those uh, that we can extract uh, from the video, we see those coordinated fashions uh, in terms of variation. Uh, and this means that if we really keep those power measurement um, as our references and keep it in a database, then when we um, have this piece of uh, uh, recordings under question, what we can do is we can use signal positive approaches, extract this EMF signal, and then we will examine uh, all the possible um, high instance in this uh, uh, reference database matching with the power to see at which part we have a high correlation, and that will be the most likely uh, time this recording was made. So that is the basic idea of exploiting those microsignals that are induced by the power grid through various mechanisms and then compare with uh, uh, reference signals uh, coming from the grid. And I don't have to be physically in the same location to, to know because of those properties. Uh, and in uh, other areas uh, in the <coughs> grid, if I keep uh, a reference, uh, I'll be able to match and then verify uh, what will be the reporting time. <coughs> So with this basic idea introduced, uh, we can see there are a number of uh, um, research issues. First and foremost, uh, we need to be able to extract this microsignal. It's very small, um, and uh, we, we need to find uh, a robust uh, and high resolution ways uh, to get those uh, instantaneous frequency. Uh, we also find it's beneficial to exploit both the base frequency that we see and as well as the harmonics uh, and utilize them to our advantages to mo make a more reliable estimation. Ah. This happened once. I do not know exactly why, but some reasons that that slides refused to show up. Uh, um, um, it, since I mentioned about uh, this um, um, research questions uh, uh, and the challenges, so when I came to know these problems, uh, um, the visual modality hasn't been, wasn't been exploited when, uh, when we started out. So that's our focus and one of the first contributions. And the, we will see what's the challenges uh, in a minute. Um, and then when we do these matchings, uh, um, the, there are always uh, be these statistical properties in the nature. So we could have uh, false positive and false negatives. Uh, and uh, analyzing those uh, statistical models uh, and exploiting those uh, would help us to make a more reliable matching. Uh, they are also, as with other security uh, questions, uh, we are working in an adversarial uh, environment. And uh, adversaries can try to circumvent this uh, forensic uh, problems and tools. And there's an uh, anti-forensic aspect and the countermeasures. Um, at toward the end, I will show you some novel applications, both in the security areas as well as beyond the securities to enable uh, tools for uh, social science researchers and for interesting immersive applications. So when we started out, it's uh, really not very obvious whether or not we could pick up ENF from a consumer level of a video camera uh, or cell phone, your cell phone cameras. Um, so to do this, uh, uh, since it uh, hasn't been explored, um, we set out to do what I call as a sanity check. First, uh, if I have uh, a highly sensitive uh, um, optical sensors, would I be able to uh, pick up those very, very mild um, brightness changes uh, in uh, a room like this. Um, so this is a, a simple circuit that we built uh, with a photo dies, uh, about eight to 10 bucks uh, uh, with a very high sensitivity commonly used in a number of uh, optical electronic work. Um, so it looks like this. And then um, since the current sensor is very weak, uh, we have uh, two level of uh, amplifications. Uh, um, and then we will measure the signals, uh, digitize them, and record them. 
And in the meantime, we will record the power references, another DIY that you can do in your, in your lab or in your dorm. Um, this is such a, a, a transformer. Um, and then to step it down to a safe voltage. And then we have another voltage dividers. Uh, and then we will measure uh, what is this uh, um, sinusoidal um, waveforms uh, um, around and then um, to record as our reference. <coughs> After that, uh, we will uh, be really boiled down to a classic signal processing problems of frequency estimation. <coughs> and here, we have a potentially time varying. It's not very, very quick, but it's also not extremely slow. So we want to be able to pick up a high resolution measurement uh, um, and uh, over time. Um, so in the simple way, if our waveform is sinusoidal very, very clean, um, for example, for the power, it's possible to do a um, zero crossing time domain. Um, but whenever we are dealing with things that coupled with harmonics potentially, as well as uh, with noise, uh, um, we can resort for some of the uh, Fourier-based uh, kind of non-parametric spectrum estimation using a spectrogram, doing a short time Fourier transform, and then it also provides the visualizations of the frequency over time. Um, and what we obtain <coughs> is this kind of cloud, but usually it has um, uh, kind of a peak dominance, but over uh, a neighborhood, and we need to read out what will be the peak uh, 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 frequencies, uh, and we can do a maximum energy. This may not be very um, robust uh, against the outliers. Uh, uh, we can do a better, uh, but also a relatively simple ones to do a weighted energy uh, by uh, weighted by the spectrum strengths. Uh, to identify where the uh, frequency centroid, we can also do some interpolations based on our understandings of the Fourier um, transforms. Uh, and those are usually work pretty well when you have a reasonably clean signals. Um, in the statistical signal processing community in the literature, we also know if we want to have very limited observations but really do high resolution uh, frequency estimations, we can resort to uh, those uh, high resolution subspace approaches by considering we are dealing with the signals with a sinusoid, may, maybe multiple sinusoid in the additive model plus the additive noise. And when we analyze the correlation matrix structures, uh, they have a very interesting um, eigen uh, properties and we can explore them um, to design um, functions uh, that we can detect and read out uh, the instantaneous frequency in that way. There are also, if we um, have knowledges that we can incorporate from, say, the power generation in some of the models, we can also uh, build some stochastic or dynamic models to track the frequencies. And once we have that, um, this is uh, uh, what you see from the photodiode, and this is from the power. Uh, from the photodiode, if you look closer, uh, we actually, this is in US measure, so our nominal frequency is around 60 hertz. Um, US grid is very stable. Our um, wiggling of that instantaneous frequency is a sub uh, um, one tenth of a hertz and sometimes even smaller. Um, and then here um, in our photo diode, we have basically the same trend, but you can see it's 120 hertz because what the photo diode pick up is really the strength, the brightness, the following a power law uh, with respect to the voltage adding to that. And that is reflection of that, and the amount of wiggle is also doubled in terms of that dynamic range. Um, when they match at the same time, you will see a high similarity. Now with that putting in place, we are confident that um, this signal, if we have uh, um, a a mechanism that is sensitive enough, we are able to pick, pick up them. The next question is when we have a consumer level of uh, video camera, would we be able to pick up uh, using video camera? Yes? So how far apart are those two measurements? How, what do you mean far apart? I mean, are they, you know, one is from the light, another is from the power? Oh, this, is, this was a proof of concept was in the same, um, in, the, in, the, in the same lab. Uh, yeah, but uh, we also have done um, in other places, uh, and also the uh, forensic scientist uh, um, Catherine Gregus also have done um, on audio, which we also are able to repeat. So when you have are in different um, uh, locations, you see that major trends will be shared. I have some examples I will show you later. Um, so going back to the video question, 
we actually will have uh, a number of challenges we must overcome in order to extract enough from your video camera. Um, not only our sensor will be much less uh, sensitive, uh, um, especially in this uh, normal uh, capturing situations, we are also dealing with uh, the problem of low sampling rate. Our typical video camera um, takes about 25 frames to 30 frames per second. But this nominal <coughs> signals in terms of the, the brightness change we already see, it is twice of our nominal power frequency. So that's 100 hertz in Asia, 120 hertz here. But we only have a 25 to 30 frame per second the cameras uh, are here. So we are significantly aliased, um, that we don't have enough sampling. But if uh, the, um, the number play out right, we may actually see a phenomenon of aliasing. And that is actually, uh, we teach students in the undergraduate courses about the aliasing on paper, but this is actually what they can actually see. Um, so to looking at this, uh, we have a potentially both the base frequency, and we did this uh, uh, initially in Asia, so the nominal frequency is 100. Uh, if you look at the Fourier spectrum, you have uh, uh, both the positive and negative frequencies that come together will be a sinusoid and cosine waveforms, and then the harmonics. Uh, when we sample at about 30 frames per second, for historical reasons uh, to mitigate other type of uh, distortions, many of our camera um, has this 29.97 frame per second to mitigate some of the uh, other type of the distortions. Uh, so we are going to have this sampled with this rate, and uh, we also taught uh, in the undergrad and learned there uh, that our spectrum is going to, in the sample domain, is going to be the spectrum replications. Uh, um, and then we focus our attention to one period uh, of this uh, sampling frequency, and then we will see those are 100 since by this periodical timing and within this one period, the base period, is going to be aliased to just above 10 hertz and just below the minus 10 hertz. And then those at 200 is aliased to just below the 10 hertz and also a replica here. And those uh, around the third harmonic, the 300 hertz, is uh, aliased just above the DC. So that is where, if we really want to look for our ENF variations, uh, using a 29.97 frame per second video camera and taking the measurement in Asia, we will be looking around the 10 hertz. And this was the same um, spectrogram plot that I showed you earlier, except I didn't highlight uh, the number there. It's 10 hertz, there's no mistake there. What you see is the alias version by this CCD camera. So to recap, what we do is, we have this video, it's an image sequence. For each of the frame, we are going to estimate what is the average brightness. And uh, we have a basically one dimensional signal. We do a frequency analysis and particularly look around those alias frequency around the 10 hertz. And that's what you observe. And if we have the power measurement at the same time, we will see them um, having the same variations. Um, just like what the audio communities have seen uh, in some recording. Um, in India, this deviation is 0.4, and when we do this alignment with the power references at the matching point, uh, they captured at the same time, you will see these uh, high similarities. Here, what we started out, again, they haven't been done before, um, so we are dealing with signals very, very small. We do not know whether we can be successful, so we give us the most favorable setup. Uh, with this brightness changes, if you have a movement, that's going to also contribute to brightness changes from frame to frame. So initially, we started with a static video. This would represent pretty much a surveillance scenarios. Um, with a small amount of uh, object movement, let's say we have a camera in one corner of this room, um, and if we have only a few of you to move, uh, we could basically exclude those movement area to focus our attention to the more static background to do this, and that will also helping us derive in that way. But in a more general situations, uh, we want to be able to account for motions. Um, um, and then I'm going to show you one example after this. This was a similar measurement of a static scene in um, China, and you can see in China those ENF variations are not as 
um, severe varying harmonics um, um, in this kind of pseudo-periodicities as well as harmonics are much more profound. With each of the harmonics, uh, we actually also have uh, uh, pretty high matchings uh, with respect to your references. Um, and we can exploit the synchrotron ratios around the harmonics and then use this uh, uh, ideas similar to maximum ratio combining in uh, mitigating the multipath to really uh, reliably combine them to make uh, reliable decisions uh, and estimations of the NF and then pass on to further modules uh, to, uh, for doing the security influencing analysis. So that's in Asia. This is when we are have the situation that we have a camera is panning. So now what's contributed to the frame by frame uh, brightness changes are uh, partly because of the scenery is changing and partly because of these micro signals uh, that's changing over time um, due to our lighting uh, hooked to our power grid and power uh, uh, applied around it is a sinusoid waveform. So you see those as blurred because uh, we have this uh, micro signals are also coupled with a stronger um, hosting signals variations. Uh, um, and when the panning stops, it's becoming more clear. Uh, but if we have a, a sufficiently long, um, multiple minutes of uh, recording, we can use the overall to make a reliable, more reliable uh, matchings. Um, so this uh, uh, illustrated the matching would could still be high, but we may require a longer record in order to make a more reliable decisions uh, uh, in the matching. Um, the moving from there, uh, we want to see if first we have could have um, better approaches to deal with the motions. Um, and uh, in a way, uh, we leverage uh, um, our knowledge about uh, uh, video processing estimate motion, if we can estimate a dominating motion and then try to compensate that, then the residual part would be carrying this uh, ENF with a possibly a uh, higher synchronous ratio compared with dealing with a directly a moving scene. And also we want to address whether this is only useful for indoor scenario. How about an outdoor scenario? Outdoor scenario you can address it in two ways. If we are near major power equipment, the um, soundtrack part may capture some of the um, ENF on, in the sound signal. On the visual signal, if we are in the outdoor, but the night, uh, at the night time, we may have a weak street light, uh, but our camera can capture those brightness, and the street light is co connected with the power grid, and that is the result we have seen. Uh, so this, again, is from the power measurement, and this is what we can derive by um, from this outdoor uh, night uh, scenery. There's also some of the details I didn't tell you. This is from, uh, not from CMOS uh, camera anymore. Uh, more popular today, we are seeing C, uh, not, not, not from the CCD camera, it's from the CMOS uh, uh, video camera, so that's becoming popular today, both in terms of quality and the cost. But CMOS camera are notoriously uh, for their artifacts. Um, they are artifacts known as rolling shutter. Our CCD camera uh, has this so-called global shutter. Even though we have a limited frame rate, we capture the entire scene. Um, my shutter is open for the entire scene 30 times per second. But for CMOS sensor, it's uh, common to have a rolling shutters. Our scene is captured line by line and sequentially read out. So if we are treating it in the same way as we do with the CCD, um, at uh, this uh, capturing time, the frame time, we actually, different lines are captured at a slightly different time. You are going to see the ENF is significantly blurred. It's very hard to reliably read out. However, if we think of this uh, um, rolling shutter not as the bad thing, uh, this is an illustration of the bad artifact. When the car moved to the new locations, uh, um, the, uh, so when we um, sand, sample the, the lower part of the, the frames, the car is already fast moving uh, to a lo new location. So you see all these artifacts. But the challenge is individual lines, so your scene content can be different. So those brightness, average brightness, can be contributed by your object is different. You have emotions, and then plus uh, a small amount uh, coming from our ENF variation. 
So we did uh, this uh, overall studies in trying to extract our microsignal from that. So by trying to subtract those uh, visual content uh, by various means um, from exploiting this uh, uh, similarity and redundancies across lines and across frames, and we also try to estimate motion and then try to subtract uh, those uh, um, motion compensated versions and giving us a residue that when we link from line by line those residues, uh, that will be a potential uh, ENF containing signal with a higher signal trust ratio compared with uh, dealing with directly line by line. So that is the basic idea how we found that doing the frequency estimation and that it was how we uh, get those uh, outdoor night scene uh, ENF showing to you. So with that uh, as a basic uh, tools, uh, uh, we then can um, utilize them to address uh, questions like uh, integrity. So if we have uh, um, some part of the video clip got uh, either removed or a new clip got put in, if we see the ENF uh, from different part of the, um, the, uh, the video frames, we are going to see they will be more contiguously changing and then all of a sudden we see a jump and those representing the inserted uh, video or some of the abrupt jump uh, could also be an indication there may be something taken out. So this will be a strong <coughs> evidence uh, indication and suggesting the potential can poor tamperings of a video. Going back to uh, Bin Laden's question, we have, yes? So uh, if I by how much dependent this recording is on the ambience, uh, uh, light ambience, and other you know artifacts in in the recording environment. Because if I would know that this is the signature that you are capturing, <coughs> mm -hmm. I can do something very similar to like <coughs> echo cancellation or something that would completely throw off your <coughs> signature. Right. So um, this is a very good question. The ENF signal is a narrow band signal. So it's um, uh, easier to remove it if we just want to remove it um, as a kind of denial of service attack um, in just to notching off. And that can be pretty easily done on the one dimensional audio side. And for the visual side, it's also possible trying to remove those uh, um, signals. Uh, what we have done, this anti-forensic studies, uh, it was uh, one of the ACN CCS paper, the journal version also published in the IEEE transactions. Uh, so what we found was if, from the forgery point of view, the primary goal of a successful forgery is not just to remove this uh, uh, ENF traces that we would be expecting for a normal um, recording, but uh, the primary goal for a forger would be um, trying to remove those uh, carrying time and the location information of, the, of today's uh, recording and then transplant something that they, of their choice so that they change the time and the location signatures. If that is done, um, then we have other, that is much more uh, difficult because we have other uh, image forensic and video forensic uh, works when you make changes to the video, there are many other regularities and uh, uniformities are being changed. And we have those uh, uh, forensic algorithms that are be able to detect. So we have actually done those work to see uh, removal is, is easy, uh, but removal and then transplant or making it uh, look like uh, an original untouched recording, that is much more difficult. So that is the, the kind of takeaway from that anti-forensic study and the countermeasures. Uh, the details will be in the paper. So going back to um, Bin Laden's video, we have a, a soundtrack and we have a visual track. If they are captured at the same time, we are expecting them to be affected by the same way as uh, um, the, the, the power grid at that time. So we were expecting to see the uh, audio tracks uh, ENF and then the visual tracks you have to be um, having the high similarities uh, and aligned uh, these uh, coordinated changes. Um, if they don't, then there's a strong indication that um, they are not captured at the same time or one would, at least one would have uh, uh, significant uh, uh, changes in the editing afterward. Yes? So you keep saying like same trend, so uh, it's like, like it's and mm -hmm. other 
Um, yeah, so I think here the, uh, the correlation, so you can formulate it as a hypothesis testing uh, problems. And if we have a, a good understanding on the statistical properties, then we can design the detection accordingly. If we don't, uh, we could make some Gaussian assumptions. And when we measure the similarities, that would be leading us to a correlation type of detectors. We also found that because you, you can see um, this, uh, uh, the control mechanisms will um, kind of try to stabilize this uh, uh, frequency variations. You, so we do see those kind of pseudo periodical trend. So sometimes they go up and go down. And this kind of correlations uh, in that raw instantaneous uh, frequency domains uh, can trigger some of the, uh, potentially trigger some of the force, uh, uh, force alarm. Uh, because when you are aligning those uh, uh, upper areas together and then deep uh, align with deep, even though they are not the right uh, top, you would trigger a higher side lobe in that. Uh, so what we found is if we can run um, a decorrelation, just think of as a whitening in your hypothesis testing um, uh, formulations, and that will actually improve the matching performance. So statistical modeling uh, is important. Um, and that also has to do with uh, what our understandings on the um, frequency changes, some of the power, uh, uh, grid power engineering knowledge can help us devise a better um, statistical model. And this is also an area I think is really for very well within the CSAFE's uh, scope that can and the worst uh, look into further. That's part of larger data collection in high quality. Um, and also uh, to do that statistical modeling. You can also address whether those things would uh, have some self repetitions uh, at a different uh, day, but a similar time and similar seasons and longer term uh, data collections and analysis can be done. Well, I want to mention this is not only for this what I would call as a forensically binding the audio visual side, that can also be extended to any multiple streams uh, of sensing that sense uh, together. So for the uh, non security application, you can think of this as a powerful way to synchronize multiple streams together. And I'm going to show you some of the video examples later for those applications. <coughs> um, going back to our question about time and location. So where the location information coming in? Uh, when we try to do this matching, uh, we have uh, um, we need to really match with the right grid and with the right time we will have a high similarity. So in the matching process with the ENR itself is already a joint time and the grid location matching. In the case of the US, uh, if we suspect this recording was made in the US, we will be uh, looking at the power reference recordings uh, of Eastern Grid, West uh, and the Texas and then we see with each of the possible grid this can, could come from with uh, in line with all the possible uh, times that this could come from and see with which one we have a high similarity above a certain threshold. So that would be how we can get the time and the location. But you already can sense that this could be a tedious process uh, uh, if we don't have uh, um, just the US, this, if this could be a recording coming anywhere from the world. Certainly, the simple measurement uh, and simple observations of the whether it's a 50, 60 hertz can give us a true counts. But even within each, the locations uh, can be um, hundreds of millions of kilometers uh, uh, of the areas. So what do we do? Do we still do uh, exotic search all the possible good, um, and then um, really looking at, and we must uh, then have all the concurrent power recordings in order to do this uh, matching. There are also situations not only because of uh, these computation issues uh, when we have to do so many matches. Sooner or later we could trigger a false positive but despite the false positive in itself rate can be very low. So we want to see can we do this uh, more efficiently with uh, a hierarchical that if we can um, looking at some of the attribute of this variation, quickly narrow down whether it is from North America or whether it is from certain part of Asia, certain part of Europe. And then uh, we look at if we have a concurrent recording, I can further tell you uh, what's the time. Even if I don't, I would be able to know what are the location. And that for some of the applications where you have a kidnapping video, you have 
child exploitations, uh, those uh, location information without concurrent recording can be powerful. So we want to see, is that possible? Uh, to answer that question, uh, I plot for you the data we collected through leveraging our personal trip and the conference trips from different parts of the world, just the three samples. Our eastern US, we are very, very stable, um, almost uh, constant. I have to zoom in for you um, to see that the detail trend indeed, uh, our um, control mechanism is working and try to stabilize those. Um, India, um, as we mentioned earlier, their swing is bigger. They are a bigger grid, so usually has better um, chance to stabilize, but their control mechanisms may not be as sophisticated as uh, what the US have as well as in terms of the power resources may not be as abundant to stabilize. You see that swings uh, can be um, as big as half of the herds. Um, Lebanon, um, in an area where there's a very uh, political instabilities, a very limited uh, power supplies, often have a blackout of one of my students working on this was originally from Lebanon, and they, you can see big swings, and even in those uh, relatively stable areas, it has a different uh, kind of patterns compared with the uh, India. So this suggests to us that there's some statistical properties uh, if we're just looking at this uh, ENF instantaneous uh, uh, signals, and if we can derive useful features, uh, and then we can uh, formulate this as a machine learning pattern recognition uh, problems uh, and to classify to answer what would be the likely grid. And those training data we can gather offline. We don't have the concurrent uh, uh, power recordings. So that is what we set out to do. The easy uh, features we can get mean, variance, the dynamic range. Uh, we also see, want to know those uh, detail, the fashion of variation. And for that, uh, we found it beneficial to look at this uh, high frequency transform of wavelet, looking at a different subband signals examine their variations, uh, coming up with the numbers, simple numbers like variance, uh, and that will give us uh, about a dozen of the features. Um, another useful feature is to do uh, AR modeling. I mentioned about uh, their similarities, and we found it um, would be very uh, well modeled using the AR, uh, second order AR models. That's also kind of matching with the intuition of this power generation with this second order dynamic uh, process. So those parameters and the uh, variance of the innovations can be used for features um, that we can line up. And uh, I'm going to visualize for you a few features. So you can see by different features that those are wavelet features and some with the mean value. So you can see they help us separate a different uh, uh, grid in the world. Um, and uh, we can use um, um, SVM type of classifiers and in the future if we get a uh, more data, we could also uh, exploit some of the deep uh, uh, network structures for these uh, classifications. Um, from power, a signal is uh, easier to classify. Uh, more often, if we are looking at media forensic, we have those ENF derived from the sound signal. That is much more noisy. So we also examined uh, in our uh, journal papers, uh, if we only have the luxury to do the power recording, um, and then how we can transfer these trainings uh, to um, um, uh, look at and classify those sound recordings that uh, ENF are much no no noisy. So we examine the various uh, uh, different issues there. Um, this we, after our research initially, we uh, formulated this uh, um, as a, a competition problems uh, and we win the um, uh, topic selections from the IEEE Signal Processing Society. This was last year's uh, global student competition, so called the SP Cup, Signal Processing Cup. Uh, that's uh, 5,000 for the first prize, plus all the travel grant to go to, uh, that was uh, held in Shanghai, um, to, uh, for the final competition. We have uh, students uh, um, really very enthusiastically um, in, the, in Asia uh, participating in last year's. Uh, there's also uh, one of the second prize team from Purdue, um, and then the winning team was from Bangladesh. Um, so we will be hoping that in the future SB Cup, uh, maybe more involvement from students here that can also be a very interesting experience for them. Um, so you can read more about this uh, SP Cup and also a sample data set we assembled for these competitions that covering 10 grid around the world. 
Um, and you can read those uh, from the single passing magazine last September, and then also the corresponding data set hosted on the new IEEE data port repository. Uh, going back to the location questions, uh, we know we so far are stay with the grid level of the location. The grid can be very big, uh, such as our eastern grid. Uh, a natural question is whether or not there is uh, traces that with fine uh, <coughs> locations in the ENF. Um, the, so can we narrow down the location by based on the uh, the ENF information? Um, the Answer is actually yes, we did uh, observe some of these microscopic uh, different changes. Um, and this is uh, what we did. We use uh, three locations on the um, East Coast. Um, and then we do uh, um, concurrent recordings, two recordings at each location. Uh, Princeton is uh, almost in the midpoint, slightly closer to College Park than uh, Boston, Cambridge areas. Um, and you can see those ENF recordings. The major trends are indeed at different locations in the same grid. They all have this coordinate variation. But if you look, look closer, um, they have some detailed, I call it microscopic changes. So we want to exploit those location specific changes um, by using this sub uh, feature extraction to extract the detailed trends. And then we cross correlate uh, between different locations. Uh, the top ones is uh, just uh, Maryland correlates with Maryland. Of course, you have a high correlation. But the interesting one is from this black. The black one is those detailed trends, the features we correlate between um, Princeton, New Jersey, and the College Park. And then the uh, green ones were from um, Princeton and uh, Cambridge, Boston area. Those uh, geographical distance are slightly um, uh, larger. And we see the similarity is slightly lower. And the magenta ones is the College Park and uh, Boston areas. The distance is the largest. The similarity is the lowest. So what we found that is interesting is by using ENF, uh, this detailed trends of similarity, we were able to connect the pairwise ENF uh, similarity with uh, the distance. Oh, it's a geographic reason in this case, but what we actually further investigation show, this actually relate to the wire distance. And this means we could potentially set up three reference locations. And then uh, if we have a recording with locations unknown, we can extract ENF, compare with the detailed trends of ENF with reference nodes, and that similarity will relate to us with the distance, and then we can do trilateralization. Yes? The, the, the reforms you showed, like, is it a, uh, if you are a disturbance, for example, those waveforms are completely different. If we have uh, major dis discrepancies, the waveform can be different. Uh, um, that I understand from the power co community. But if we are in uh, normal working situations, uh, you will see them has very close similarities. Yes? But I think these are from power recordings, correct? <coughs> these from the power recordings. The audio may be very tough. To audio will be much noisy, and that is part of our work in progress. So in, in principle, that traces are still there, but we have a much more noisy. We have very low signal to, to, to work on. But so, I yes? I think US may be tough, but in India or in other places, maybe you Maybe, but because your swing is bigger. Mm -hmm. So your kind of our signal to noise ratio can be potentially higher in that. Um, so that is one of our kind of attempt to looking at uh, um, localized uh, within the grid. Uh, so that is uh, some further um, investigation in different uh, um, areas. So I want to um, um, uh, wrap up uh, with uh, some examples uh, to looking at the ENF not only for security purposes, it's also in historical recordings. Social scientists want to know many of the presidential White House recordings exactly when it was made, and uh, there's lack of those information. So we are envisioning that um, if we can gather those recordings with known time, such as from some of the NPRs from from different uh, uh, resources, we actually could potentially piece together an ENF map. That historically, the ENF information after the power generation, by my best understanding, by talking with uh, various uh, power um, colleagues, uh, it wasn't really recorded. Uh, from this point of time, it was recorded, it has been recorded, but historically, it may not. And what you see uh, was from the Kennedy White House recording. 
And you see in this case uh, two traces. They were actually supposed to be all around similar frequency, but we are just lucky in this particular case that the recording speed and the playback digitization speed are not at the same time. So we see actually two traces, one coming from Kennedy time, the other coming from the digitization time, which is in itself also a single processing process. So we are telling the digital archivist, uh, now when you are digitizing, please record the ENF at that digitization time. Knowing that information, we can help better preserve that historical ENF, which contain valuable information about the time, about the location, and can help us also um, support other materials uh, um, in the historical context. Um, we can also utilize this uh, as a reference. Uh, um, another historical recording is from the Apollo mission. And this was a recording um, when uh, Neil Armstrong just finished uh, the moon landing mission, returning to the moon module, uh, the, 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 the shuttle uh, modules, uh, and uh, the Houston has a hard time to get hold of him. Um, the recording of this uh, has really severe distortion. Traditionally, we have to use knowledge to do this um, trial and error. But what you will see, how uh, we can use ENF to help to restore. So let's listen to the this distorted ones. So what you are hearing is that uh, looks like. Uh, Wah, wah, wah. Uh, very, very low um, because uh, the, the, the tape rotating speed was severely distorted. Um, and traditionally, we we'll have to use a uh, trauma error to retain to, um, retain to the, um, 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 uh, restore to the right speed. But we actually don't have to do the guessing work. The ENF is there. That's actually very profound for these magnetic tape recordings. Uh, uh, if we look at that, we can see those uh, frequencies supposed to be around the nominal, uh, but now it's really ten, more than 10 hertz of deviation. We can use this, it serves as our pilot sequences to help us restore. And that, by just using that ENF to do the restoration, it should sound look like this. Uh, so uh, that is one of the use uh, for supporting digital humanity doing restoration. And I mentioned about uh, multiple sequences. Today you have this camera can do panorama of still pictures stitching together. We all have this also take video. We can go to your football games uh, and sitting in different areas uh, and we can in theory could align a multiple view video. You don't see that uh, uh, kind of software capability easily. Um, maybe only for big players like NFL, they have all this infrastructure there. But why? The geometries uh, from computer vision is already there. But what's missing is for this video alignment, not only you need to do this geometry alignment, but also have to do tempo alignment. Without running the same dedicated softwares, our uh, videos are not synchronized. So we need to do the drawing time and this uh, spatial uh, alignment. That's a tremendous amount of computation by playing with the video has a huge data volume. But if we can decouple utilizing ENF, either coming from the soundtrack or derived from the visual track, we can use that to do the preliminary uh, temporal alignment. And that will be narrowed down to even if we have to do some fine search, uh, will be narrowed down to what frames we will search for. And then uh, we will be able to do a more refined uh, uh, alignment. That also support significantly challenging geometries, like the examples here. Um, the top ones is not synchronized, these original recordings. The bottom ones was um, to use the soundtrack ENF to align them. And you can see from the computer vision side, the viewing angle actually quite different. If you can re um, referencing that uh, doorknob here. And that also means uh, even with the recordings done in different locations but in the same grid, we can align them. And that's the, 
that's uh, the clock. I mean, using clock, we try to show they are synch they are synchronization clues. Uh, but those uh, recordings, uh, two videos, are um, 10 meters apart, one in the office, one in the lounge. And you can synchronize it using the in-app um, And we can also do some other, even when this person is out of the scene. So even when it is out of scene, we, can, we are able to synchronize without a visual clue. Those are just two ad hoc uh, captured video, and you can synchronize. So that will support various immersive applications. So this really wrap up uh, um, the, the main overview of this area of the research. We have various uh, publications. If I'm interested in, I will be happy to uh, point you to the um, uh, related to papers. Um, and there are many of paid the way, suppose the funding agencies, uh, my co collaborators uh, with a very graduate student, and my collaborators uh, in the iSchool for digital humanities, social science related applications. Uh, just to do advertisement to single process magazine is a great resource for various uh, uh, single processing related things, including SPCA uh, article that you can learn about. Uh, um, and I really want to thank you for your attention today. Thank you.